So with that, I'm open for questions. Uh, two questions. So in the uh, demo, you showed the five conditions. Yeah. So they are not domain specific. Those conditions are domain specific. But The determination process is not domain specific, but the names you use are domain names specific. Names you use is domain, but how do you bring in the model to into this? The model is being developed along the way. So let's go back to this picture we were looking at, right? Model is being built on the inflow and the facts that you are providing. So when you provided the raw data, Falconry translated that raw data into a model. Now, that model, in the absence of any facts, is purely unsupervised. But your algorithm is definitely supervised. So it, it can do unsupervised. It can also do some amount of supervision. And it can do full supervision. All three are possible. So you are bringing the facts for the modeling as well as using the raw data. Correct. So Where you have facts, use those. In the absence of facts, use the inflow. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes. Um, I have some two questions. But uh, first of all, I think I know the answer to this. But I imagine, say, if you already work with one wind operator, yeah, you could develop from that uh, a model that you could use for another wind operator. Yes. I imagine is that something you're working on, or is there? No, it's available. The, the, the data is so proprietary that. No, it's available. So here I have two plans, right? Mm -hmm. So I have plan number one and two. On plant one, I provided one example of a pitch issue, mm -hmm. and Falconry found pitch issues in the other one. Right. But I mean, in other words, if you already develop, if the neighbor already uses it, you said it takes so much time for another. So if you go to another wind operator and becomes your customer, you could potentially have a, a generic model that you could use to help exactly. you start. Yes. Basically, the whole idea is how do you get people started quickly? Mm -hmm. Because, yes, over time, you'll find idiosyncrasies. but you don't want to wait until you have the perfect model for that new customer. So you can start with the one that you already created. So that's what you are doing. So you learn yes. from one, one type and then basically provide the starter kit. Yeah. I mean, well, we are not specifically in the business of harvesting models from one customer and providing them to another. But let's say your business or the business of your customer is to support or is to provide managed services for wind power generation. Right? Today you have three customers. And then tomorrow you hire or acquire five more customers. You should be able to apply whatever you've developed to those guys. But we are not in the way to either prevent you from or monetizing that opportunity. And the other question is just kind of at what kind of scale can you do this at economically? For example, you're talking about saying you have a fleet of trucks. Yeah. And then, you know, potentially what if you want to Ford wanted to monitor all the trucks in North America. Mm -hmm. Well, so you know, the best example I can take is the Takata airbags. Just imagine if we had some sense of what the inflation characteristics of these airbags were like when they were being produced, and what it was like when they were getting deployed. And we could tell that these airbags are not being deployed correctly. Right? How many billion dollars settlement is Takata going through right now? I mean, so it's. Ultimately, it's an economic trade-off, and I think it is going to vary from one domain to another. Right. I can't quite answer that. Because it depends on the conditions and the data you can measure about it. I think Phil's question was maybe speaking to, if you imagine all the trucks that Ford produces, how, might, how, how large or how complex of a system would you guys have to build out of your appliances to be able to deal with okay. It's a good question. I won't claim to be confident about the answer, but I can propose something. So a couple of things. One, there are variations in makes. Not so much model years, but or rather not so much model years, but makes and models. So you probably want to create a pipeline. This is, this is a pipeline. You want to create a pipeline to deal with a make and model. So across Ford, you might have 50 make and models of trucks. Uh, maybe fewer. And then each one of them might run a few million trucks through them. And Falconry will parallelize all the work across all of them. 
Um, the other thing that we are working on, all right, just let me, let me come to that point later. But one of the things that happens when you have a fleet, or for that matter, when you are live monitoring, is that you will encounter new patterns for the very first time after you have developed your AI model. Happens all the time. Because there's no deterministic way of knowing that you have all the patterns available that you're going to need later. And so what Falconry does, just like we are able to see these unlabeled patterns, right, we have these unlabeled patterns even after we gave three examples, which means that Falconry can tell you need more examples. In the same way, when Falconry is live monitoring, it can tell you that new patterns are emerging. So that becomes the basis to isolate new behaviors and use them to improve the AI for everybody else. And learning across a few million vehicles at the very beginning is probably going to be computationally difficult, let's just say that. You don't need all of that data. You need representative data, and this is really a question of whole data learning or sampled learning. We get that. And we are working on mechanisms by which we can be fairly good about sample learning and not leave anything out there, but be computationally efficient about it. So that's the whole data learning side. But the whole data scoring, you know, keep doing it all day long. So human nature is to want to know why in the market for yeah. machines, to want to know why for machines, um, especially if they actually have to go and, and, and you know, investigate what is going on in reality. Yeah. How do you deal with that? How do you do why? Right. <clears throat> so the first thing is that because this is of a time series nature, our premise is that there is visual indication present in the data that Falconry is picking up. Right? So the very first thing we say is, you can see right here why. Let's actually drill into one of these. There you go. You can see why. This is clearly unusual. Now, what does this mean in that field? Meaning, why would the heat sink go down to zero? Why would pitch control cabinet go down to zero? Why would average RPM go down to zero? Why would average wind go down to zero? Right? Why? I mean, why is a never ending question, right? There's no such thing as real root cause analysis. It can keep going back and back. But you can do some proximate cause analysis. Falconry enables at least the first level, doing that visually. Secondly, there are some mathematical means to understand what pushed this over the edge, right? What changed that made this system go from whatever condition it was in, and actually let's bring back our colors now. What changed from normal to bring it into a pitch issue? Evidently, there was another pattern just preceding that pitch issue, which means that might have been the early sign that a pitch issue is building up. Now, why it happened can be seen in terms of perhaps parameters as to which parameters diverge the most from what they are expected to be normal. But is that a good enough answer? Perhaps. It might help some people understand what may be uh, changed to bring the system back into what is desirable. That's an area we have left open at the moment because it is not clear that that approach alone will work for people. And naturally, it is also computationally expensive to know exactly what caused the system to go from state x to state y, knowing that there can be any number of x and y's. Yes? So do you also um, do prediction or uh, predictive trend? For example, like for the fleet, for the fleet like when you should be scheduled for all the check <clears throat> Good question, and actually, this is a perfect time to answer that question. So you notice here, pitch issue was marked down here, right? And Falconry is saying that there is a condition that happened just before the pitch issue, which, by the way, if I put this bar here, it will make it clearer. You can see Falconry saw the occurrence of the pitch issue earlier than when you thought it was happening. Plus, it said that there was another pattern that arose before the pitch issue even happened. So you could now label this pattern as your warning. That becomes 
your basis to tell somebody that this is going to happen, right? We don't guarantee how long ago it will happen. We cannot guarantee that it will be um, present, that a warning will occur before the pitch issue arises. Because that really resides in the domain. Whether or not it can happen, we don't know for sure. That's an area of future work. Um, but there's another part of your question, which is, can you predict a future state? And predicting a future state is a little bit like regression. What Falconry is doing is not regression. It is here, it is actually doing classification. Could you also detect like a correlation between multiple time series? Yeah, this is all multivariate. So like so, to say, you want to say these two things co occur together or like Yes. Good. Well, OK. So there are several ways I can answer it. But do you want to give an example, maybe, so that I can focus on the one you care for? Oh, well, let's say you talk about stock price, right? Like gold and oil price always going up and down together. Okay. Correlation, tangent. Uh, we are doing that internally, but like let's say I have multiple set sensors, hundreds of them. I yeah. want to know like which yeah. one can I correlate? Okay. Mean there's no no need to collect all that information. Because That's right. Yeah. Dimension reduction. So we, at the time of feature extraction, try to find out what feature components are actually redundant, don't have any information. So we could tell you at this point that at least in the space that you're monitoring and the patterns that are present in it, I don't really have a use for these feature components. And I can back out of it and say, I don't have a use for the source of those feature components, which would be some of these raw time feed. So you could stop collecting them. Okay. But that's only provided that we are right. Because who knows if the patterns do change at some point in the future, there's no guarantee of that. So, so uh, at this stage, you use that kind of like PCA just or like for here, yeah, for dimension yeah. reduction. Mm -hmm. And then for uh, semi-supervised clustering, what type of machine learning algorithm do you? Use? Well, clustering is just clustering. Clustering is k-nearest neighbor Euclidean distance. Okay, so you don't then. But it's a combination of the k nearest neighbor and in fact this is random forest right then it? yeah it's a combination and the way we put these two together to behave like semi supervised that i think is a little unusual i think we have crafted something so that it works as semi supervised but it's really both things that combine semi supervised just the random forest or the uh, with some regularization and like this should be and like that type of no i mean this yeah, so semi-supervised learning internally does clustering and random forest, but it combines them in a way such that there is generalization from a small number of examples to a larger space. And it relies on clustering as a means of doing that generalization. One day we'll write a paper about it. Yes. Yes, yes, that was an intelligent question. I, I didn't mean to say that we are currently not um, sort of source quenching, but it could be done. I thought there was a question here as well. Um, okay, sorry. I, I have a question. You were describing a project that one of your partners is doing that relates to earthquake prediction uh, or anticipation. <laughs> okay, let me just tell you a very quick uh, background of that company. Uh, they're based in Palo Alto. They've been uh, collecting electromagnetic waves or electromagnetic radiation produced in the Earth's crust for the last 10 years in about 150 places. A lot of it is around the Pacific Rim and especially in the US and North America. And they have a theory that when 
rock compresses other rock through slip strike zones or through subduction zones or wherever, that it releases energy in the form of electromagnetic uh, radiation. And so they have placed magnetometers up and down the coast to measure that radiation in nano Teslas at 50 hertz sampling rate. Right? So they do this all day long. The data is theirs. And they probably, and they've written science papers to describe why that data can be a good way to find out well enough in advance an earthquake is going to happen. So they've done the science for that. So they're basically, because of the, I guess you'd say, almost novel configuration of sensors, they're identifying these pressures Correct. for Correct. the pressures. So falconry is not creating the science for earthquakes. No, no. But Falconry is helping them turn the science into a system for earthquakes. It's work. They say that it is working. <laughs> <laughs> right now they focus. The test will be if they install this in Japan. I'm holding off buying my earthquake insurance for the next four months on this. <laughs> Oklahoma. Yeah, Oklahoma has. It used to get two earthquakes a year. That was uh, Richter scale three and above. Now it's 50 a year. Mind boggling. Yeah, so I think it's important to realize that behind the success of this approach really is the science and the intuition of the experts in those domains. Right. You're reducing the cost of the experiment so they can run a lot more experiments a lot more quickly. Exactly. I mean, if you reduce the cost of doing an experiment essentially to zero, just imagine how many experiments you can do. Some of them are going to work. Right now, the cost of experiment is so high that you can only do one, and it better work. And that's why AWS is bringing some of the startups. <laughs> 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 Cloud services. Yeah. The cost of the data center starts from zero. That's right. <laughs> so, so your system will Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, the same approach that I was showing you to mark conditions, you can use them. For example, here, you can click on it. You can say clear it, and now it is no longer a pitch condition. Right. So you can add, remove. I mean, this is basically document. You can edit it. Um, now, false positives in particular. You got to provide positive examples, meaning you cannot just say you're wrong. <laughs> what is right then? Right? So you got to mark it as normal if you think that it is not a pitch issue. Or give it another name. You can, yeah, because at the end of the day, this is mathematically determined, right? If you tell a computer 2 plus 2 is not 4, then what is it? Question? In your picture with the five uh, stages, where is that adaptation most critical? It is in the semi-supervised learning. And here's why. Semi-supervised learning is where we are connecting the numbers to the intent. This whole time has been a very linear transformation of space. The um, convolution happens at this point. And the convolution is where intent has to somehow reflect in the underlying logic. And so, sorry, I, I'm answering feedback. Is your question was about adaptation? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So you get the feedback part, I hope. Mm -hmm. The adaptation is in determining a number of things, like what is the right number of k? Or how do I bound a cluster? Or um, what rate of resampling should I be using? Uh, I mean, there are these kinds of things that you have to determine from the data. So which one of these affects your success rate? Uh, the most critical that we actually make a known to the user is the length of the window that is used for all this analysis. I can show it to you. 
So you notice here it says model revision number three. It used all this data um, and it had a sliding window with a lower bound of one hour and an upper bound of 30 days. What it's saying is at every point in time as I'm doing the assessment, I'm using some trailing history. That trailing history will be different for each signal because that depends on the signal. But there is a bound here that I should not use windows that are smaller than one hour long. Now that has the effect of doing some low pass filtering, but it also has the effect of relating your intent or your intuition about the domain to the math that is being performed. So this is the one flag that is exposed to users. And if I now say, let's generate a new revision, and you'll have a choice to change it. So you can experiment with it. So this is the most critical success factor. And this varies because depending on your intent, is the pattern that you are interested in a really long range one or is it a short range one? And the signal is convolving everything anyway. Right? So we'll find everything, but then the result that you see, you may not be able to interpret. So this becomes essentially a question of intent and the right logic to use for that intent. By the way, we do discover these windows automatically. And uh, we've looked at various ways of doing it. Um, yeah, naturally, our spectrum densities, autocorrelation, and simple frequency transformation techniques as well. Um, but there's more work. We are happy with what we have, but we know that there are ways to make it better. Yes? Uh, what kind of database or storage do you use to hmm. store and process huge amounts of time series data? Boy, that's a tough one. I don't want to, I don't want to uh, piss off any of my partners. <laughs> um, there are probably many technologies, and that's why we do not claim to be the uh, permanent store for time series data. We don't provide it. We have a buffer, and that buffer is used so that we have quick access to the data that might be used for learning. But we have now started working with people who have their own existing data stores, who don't want to move that data anywhere. And they just want to put falconry on top of that data store. So if you've already gone through a lot of the hard work of choosing the right data storage technology, keep it. And then we will work with our customers to help them use that data with falconry. Now, of course, one of our preferences is that that data is amenable to Spark because it simplifies so many things. And it gives you computational efficiency as well. So if it is a Spark compatible store, that is always ideal. And not just compatible in terms of being able to access data, but being able to place computation next to the data. So what's your take on, on the deep learning technique? Some people say, well, we use deep learning for the straw bunch of signal treat it as a black box string, and they just use the Yeah, yeah, I mean, Mandar knows this. Um, I was doing facial feature recognition using neural networks in my undergraduate thesis project. And so I've been fascinated with neural networks for a really long time. Um, but I've learned a lesson being in this industry for the last seven years, is that if this underlying technique, I mean, of course, I showed you the, the flow here, but if anything here is complex or suspicious, it's going to get knocked out for two reasons. One, ultimately, the process engineer is running the plant. If this thing tells the process engineer to do something that the process engineer believes and executes upon, then they have to have confidence about it. And they cannot develop confidence if they cannot understand it. Problem with deep, deep learning systems is that it's a bag of weights and it's very hard to know how did those weights come about. So you have to keep it simple. That's what we've learned from the market. Now, that's not to say that that's the only way to do it. Primarily applied to these kind of industrial applications. Primarily applied to industrial applications, even to health, uh, even to environmental. I mean, nobody wants to get panicked. 
and make the wrong choice. Right? So that's the underlying premise here. However, there are ways in which you can compare whatever you are getting from this path with a deep learning system to see if maybe you could do better. So you feel like deep learning is more like black box, so too much of a black box. Well, I'll tell you more things, but yes, that is my biggest beef with deep learning. The others are you need a lot of computation and you need a lot of examples. Now, it's not true for all deep learning techniques. There are certain ways you can use convolutional networks that work free of examples. And that could potentially go fast. One of the things you told me the other day that I thought was interesting is you, you guys are trying to detect the first event. Exactly. First, first the first time, event. First time it happens. So that's a, that's you have no examples. Kind of <laughs> you have no examples. So, so these, are, these are lessons we have learned by, I mean, in some ways, the last five years of my life have been really about understanding why this problem exists and what does not work. It may change. And especially as we try to generalize it to more problems, it's likely that they will be more accepting of black box techniques like deep learning. But in keeping it to what we have, which is, can you see that number, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, whatever the digit is? If a computer can recognize it as it scans the text, would you believe it? Right? Because it's a visual task that a person can perform. If a computer can do it equally well and faster, then you'd probably pay somebody to use it. Anything beyond that, I think, is a little magical that'll be difficult to push in the market. Customer. And do you provide any need to, for example, for overfitting data or something like this to help to adjust the model? Okay. So I want to just confirm that you understand when I say customer, I, I really mean it. Falconry deploys on premise, behind network. And the models are created there. We have no access to them. So we really don't control models. Okay. Right? And that's how a lot of people are beginning to deploy. Okay. So is it done for questions yeah. or just parameters of models? And it's all done inside the software. It's, that's why I say it, right? Adaptation. So if our software is wrong, sorry, you've got to wait for a bug fix. <laughs> right? so but that. That's fine too. Yeah, that's fine. That's we'll, fine. We'll deploy in the cloud. We have been, we already deployed it in Azure, Google Cloud, and Oracle bare metal IS. Okay. So we are cloud ready. We are built for the cloud. But many people want to deploy it behind networks and inside plants. And we are good for that as well. People are doing both. Um, we run can run on distributed clusters. Network, unnetworked as well. Correct. Yes, that's what I was going to come to next, which is when you asked, how do you prevent overfitting? Um, so overfitting is going to happen over here, right? And that overfitting is a result of the facts that you are providing. And yes, there could be errors depending on what facts you are using. In fact, Greg yesterday, Greg Kufera, he was asking, I have some facts, but not all of them are right, and I don't know which ones are right. How will you work? Normal situation. Okay. Normal situation, right? It happens all the time. And so then, Falcon is actually going to evaluate, because all this far is mathematical and does not deal with labels at all, we reduce the likelihood that there is overfitting. We don't eliminate it. And then we are using some examples and looking for consistency of examples to perform this step in the semi-supervised domain. So we can mitigate it, but I don't think we can eliminate it. You mean that the uh, uh, software allows to split uh, data set on learning and uh, evaluation set? Yes. Yeah, I mean, of course, that too. But um, you can't control the level of accuracy and which uh, depends on the neural data that you present to your model. Correct. You can just control. 
Yeah, so you have the ability to test models. So for example, let's say you had, you'd use one year of data, out of which six months were used for training and six months were kept aside for testing. And you can come into this test tab, run a new test, pick a revision that you want to test, select the period of time, and um, load some expected results and let Falcon reproduce its own results and then compare side by side. So you can test. So you will be able to guess, get, you'll be able to assess how well it is learned, is it overfit or underfit. Um, but the separation, we don't know how much you want to separate. Those are macros that we could build on top. We don't currently have them. By the way, everything that I've shown you here is available through APIs. So this entire product is really a service. It is not an application, it's not a solution, right? But it's a productized service. And so any step you like to perform, can be performed through this API. Well, I won't call it an IoT server. IoT server has probably got to do a lot more. But it's basically doing time series pattern recognition. It's just an API for that. Yeah, we've, you know, we've considered what we call the thing that Falconry does, and we've realized that it's better to be upfront. It only does pattern recognition, and it only works for time series data. It doesn't do anything else. It's not a full-fledged IoT platform. It's not a platform even, for that matter. It's an engine. Use it how you like it. Put it into whatever applications or solutions you want to create. And use it in whichever domain matters to you. Ultimately, at the end of the day, while we have responsibility to produce good results and we keep making it better, the data you collect, the phenomenon that occur in your world, and the facts you have are going to determine to a large extent the quality of results you get back. So we cannot be better than you. We can only help you become better. How do you uh, determine the right granularity of uh, data aggregation if, if there's any aggregation happening? I, I understand that in IoT it's mostly sampling and signal that you're taking. But in uh, other domains, such as internet, you can have daily revenue, you can yeah. have hourly revenue, you can have. That's a good question. So we deal with. We deal with occurrence-oriented data, like POS, for example. Every time a purchase occurs, it throws off data. And we will take data of that kind, which is not the typical IoT data, because it's not sampled regularly. It is whenever it occurs. And we will determine by looking at that data and how often it is produced to figure out how to sample it, how to aggregate it, how much to aggregate or how little to aggregate. So those are also parts of the adaptation that I was showing you in the future. That's the signal normalization. And so it has to be done driven from the data that you're collecting. So there's no one answer, but there is a logic to that answer. Okay. So it automatically does the aggregation? Yeah, it does the aggregation automatically. Um, just to show you here, so you add a new pipeline by picking a source of data. Let's just say KDI125. And one of the things you are asked is, this is the data I found in your event buffer. Is this how you want me to use it? So you can differentiate between analog, which is a sampled nature, versus digital or, or maybe events, which is of an occurrence nature. And of course, numerical versus categorical. By the way, falconry has not been proven to work on high cardinality categoricals. For example, if you use bank names in the POS transaction data, then you could possibly end up with 100,000 banks. And then looking for patterns in 100,000 different values that are not numerically organized is not something that we have proven it for. But if you have a modest number, then we'll be fine. 